Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second set of breakout sessions here at the 2021 Pittsburgh Tech Fest. We are so excited that you could join us for the second set. Um, and without further delay, I'd like to pass it over to Cameron um, with General Dynamic Mission Systems to um, kick us off here. Hey everyone, I'm Cameron Donopoulos. I'm an engineering tech lead working remotely at General Dynamics Mission Systems in Southside Works of Pittsburgh. Um, we're sponsoring this session because we, we focus on leveraging user-centered design and data-driven software engineering to build, deploy, and support software platforms and solutions to support our country's most important missions. If you have any questions, I'll paste my contact information in the chat, but now I'd like to pass it over uh, to the actual speakers, Mark Majors and Tony Turner. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm dropping a quick poll question in to our chat room. Thank you for joining today. This is how to leverage user-centered design with agile methodology. And curious to know, you know, what is your role? Where, where are you, where does your skill set lie as we go throughout today? Because we want to make sure that we are customizing our presentation around our audience, which is what we're gonna be exactly talking about today. So thank you so much for joining. I'll go ahead and pull those results here in a moment. But I wanted to start out with just a quick story. And I'm interested, when was the last time you went to a wedding reception? And, and you, you walked in and the DJ said, okay, everybody, it's time to come out to the dance floor and you hear this. And no one came out. <laughs> the dance floor is completely empty. And you're wondering, hmm. So now you're looking at the DJ and what is your feeling? Are they doing a good job because the dance floor is empty? Or did you prefer that the dance floor is packed? If the dance floor is packed, are they doing a good job? And what I realized, my career, I've been a professional DJ, been moonlighting for 20 plus years, and I've been a professional UX designer and researcher for 20 years. And I realized, wait a minute, the same two techniques actually cross over in both of these skill sets. And your application, your website is actually a dance floor. And it's being judged. If there's no one visiting, if you're looking at your analytics and there's nobody in your application, you're wondering, is it doing a good job? Just like a DJ. So as we go out today, we're going to be comparing these two things and talking about, well, wait a minute, how does this relate to agile methodology? Well, believe it or not, the process to get a crowd pumped and moving on a dance floor is very similar to software methodology. So we're going to talk about that today, and we're going to move over. But I'm going to introduce myself formally. My name is Mark Majors. I'm a user experience professional. I work at Progressive Insurance, and I'm also a professional DJ. And guess what? I'm joined here with someone else. <laughs> hey, I'm Tony Turner, um, also a user experience researcher uh, at Progressive. Um, and I'm also a magician, so I volunteer at children's hospitals through magic for the kids. Excellent. Well, taking a look at our audience out here. So it looks like Tony, you know, we are both, you know, on the research design side and it looks like we've, we've got a majority of developers, some business analysts out there, some QA. So this is a great audience. And as we go through today, we're going to be tying in all of these practices and talk about specifically what that means and, and how all this can come together. Now we talked about dance floors. We introduced ourselves, but what is, what's, what's happening with all this? Well, recently we released a book called Make Your Customers Dance that talks about thinking of UX like DJing a wedding reception. So once again, if you think about that wedding reception, you think about everything that goes into planning and getting it ready, they actually share the same technique. So we're gonna talk to you today about what that means and what they share. And I wanna start with something we hear a lot, MVP minimal viable product. I want you to erase that out of your memory. <laughs> I want you to adopt something new. MRP, market ready. 
So I want you to think market ready over minimum viable. And what does this mean? Well, who wants the minimum as a customer? I don't want the minimum. I want something that's going to meet my needs. And we've gone down this path for many, many years about minimum. And we, we just got to get it out there. But are you incorporating the user's needs into the final product? When I show up to a wedding reception to DJ, I'm not bringing the minimum. I'm bringing everything that I can to meet their needs. The same thing should be with your product because it actually is the differentiator with how we're moving forward. Now, wait a minute, Tony. Hold on a second. I think <laughs> we are up to our mantra today. Yeah, so this is our mantra today. Um, make a promise to prioritize your development based on deeply knowing your audience. Um, so that means um, we'll kind of introduce some ideas around how to um, focus your development um, on the user-centered design process um, while considering business needs, um, timing, and different variables um, that you traditionally consider, um, but how to kind of bring that user-centered perspective into it. That's right. And, and now we know it's a little cheesy, but if you could on your end, raise your hand and we want you to make a promise. I promise to prioritize my development based on deeply knowing my audience. And there's statistics that say, if you write down a promise or make a promise, you'll keep it. So we want you to think about this as we go out through today is how are you prioritizing your development based upon deeply knowing your audience? And the reality is, we are going to be covering these three topics as we go throughout today. What is the unique value of user research? How do you make time for it in Agile? And then how can this MRP, this market ready product, how can that actually unify a team? So as we go through, we're going to be talking about how we can take this higher, how we can bring UX and actually infuse that in what you're doing. And we know that all organizations have some kind of product, some system they want to promote. The reality is, how do you know your audience? we got a lot of people that say, well, you know, I know my audience, but you need to step into their shoes. But not just step into their shoes, you need to step into how they actually put their shoes on. Are they double tying them and slipping their feet in because they never want to tie their shoes? Are they Velcro shoes? Are they you know, Birkenstocks with socks? I mean, what kind of shoes are they wearing? Because that's even more detail than you may even know. And knowing early is going to be an advantage. It's going to give you an advantage. So we want you to think about your app, your software, your process, just like a dance floor, that you need to keep it packed. And as an app, you're constantly thinking about what people are doing. You don't want them to leave. Because if they leave, they're going to go to a competitor. There's plenty of competitors out there. So you want to keep them out there as much as you can. And the only way to do that is to deeply know them. So where did this come from? Well, the reality is it's something called the progression of economic value. Joseph Pine coined this phrase. In the beginning, we used to take commodities out of the ground, you know, ore, minerals. But then we ended up turning them into products. We made a car, for example. So now we have cars, great, now everyone has cars. But then how is my car better than your car? Well, then we added service. So my service is better than your service. And now everyone had the best service, so they introduced the experience. I don't know the last time you went into a car dealership, but now they have the cafe, and now they have the kids zone, and they offer all these things to make this experience valuable. They may even have you know, some game you may play that you can win a prize. Nobody knows what the next is going to be, this next value. But right now we're in this stage of experience, this economy of experience. Maybe it's AR, maybe it's VR. But the reality is it's all about the experience now. That's why you need to take advantage of that. And if you look here, we all know what our business goals are. I mean, we think about our business, we have a clear feeling what that is. We generally know what our technical constraints are. The biggest challenge is trying to figure out what the user's needs are. And that's where generally I've seen most companies fall short. So why is it valuable knowing who your audience is? Well, there's plenty of things. I mean, in development, it's going to minimize rework. So if you're continually 
waiting to the end when you launch your product, you know you're going to have to go back based upon customer feedback to fix a lot of things. If you know it earlier in the process, if you're doing inclusive design and not only including those that are, you know, your typical user, but those that are in assistive technology, you're including everyone in that final output. You're going to improve processing time so the customer doesn't have to wait as long. Your competitors, we talked about that. And then here's one that I think a lot of people forget about is when development, when your team is involved in the research early on, they're going to develop empathy. They're going to be along for the ride. And we're going to talk about that a lot today. And finally, it's going to reduce your legal risk. Right now, believe it or not, by 2035, there's going to be more older adults than children. Are we prepared for the audience that is going to be interacting with your system in a way that it's not interacting today? Have you thought about those that may have visual impairment or may have cognitive challenges? Now is the time. It's early to get that into your development process. So we want to know, why does user research get skipped? So I'm going to throw another poll out here. And I'd love for you just really quick, just drop in a couple words why you think research is getting skipped. And let me go back. I'm going to activate this poll and we'll put that on. But I just want you to just really quick figure out why you think user, you know, user research is getting skipped. So I have activated the poll and let me do that. There we go. Perfect. So go ahead and drop in just a couple words, some things that you think why user research is getting skipped. And this is always fascinating you know, when you're, you're looking at what exactly is the roadblock. Why, why are there roadblocks? And that's the one thing. I'm going to share with you the poll result, and, and then I'd be interested to see what, you're, what you think, what's, what's happening in your world. So go ahead, you know, type in a couple words and I'll go ahead and share them. So a couple things here is, you know, afraid of rework, assumptions. People think they already know their user, it takes too much time. You hit it on the money is the number one reason is it takes too much time. People think, well, I don't have the time for it. I don't have the money. And then part of that is also the agile approach, which we'll talk about today, but getting over that time is you, we're going to talk about how you can overcome that. Tony's going to get into that in a moment. And that's why it's important that your organization first needs to understand the value of UX, of user research, build that in and know that it's actually a differentiator in competitiveness. And Google builds their total product around this. So many other companies have adopted it. So it's important to think about that. So let's now talk about how we make time for it, because like we said, time is the number one reason, and we heard about that. Tony, how do we take our time to do it right? Yeah, so in thinking about Agile, um, as you know, it kind of functions within um, sort of a sprint structure, um, and you can actually integrate UX into that structure. Um, main thing is um, kind of providing a runway, um, getting a seat at the table initially, um, so that means involving UX professionals in the process um, uh, during that discovery stage. Um, so before you actually get into developing the product, um, and and that's kind of the main thing is, is getting in early. Um, so then B, you want to create a lane for the work, uh, a sprint or PI ahead. So that means um, from a UX research and design perspective, um, within the sprint structure, you want to be a sprint ahead. So you want to have uh, your designer kind of working and um, before the actual development gets um, processed for that particular uh, sprint. And then um, we want to change terminology. So Mark mentioned MRP, market ready product, and we'll get into a calculator that includes a user uh, research output and sort of prioritization structure that includes also um, some of the other traditional elements that you care about from a development perspective to prioritize your products. Um, so we'll take a look at that. And then referencing a persona. So a persona is a uh, profile of an end user um, that um, kind of indicates 
kind of their goals and needs and things like that. And it kind of gives us a picture of, of the person and the people that are interacting with our product. So you can have multiple personas um, on your product, but it just kind of helps you remain, keep that empathy uh, that Mark mentioned earlier. Um, so you want to add UX to the definition of done as well. Um, so that kind of means that um, it, it's, you know, in, integrated into, you know, your finished product. And you want to think about how to do that throughout the development process. You can merge UX research into the backlog refinement as well. Um, so, so you can kind of develop that process and put it into the actual development uh, system. And then continual education on the value of UX. You want to keep up your understanding of the user experience um, sort of um, output and industry and um, kind of understanding what it really means to do user research and user experience design. Yeah, and I think pe getting people involved will help with that as well. Mm -hmm. So this 110-100 rule, uh, it really means that um, if you get in early, it costs less to um, actually, um, you know, uh, get feedback and profit and, and develop your um, your uh, product. So so if you wait until you begin to evaluate that user experience, you may have to go back and do a changes in your development, major changes, which cost more money, of course. Um, so that's kind of what this 110-100 rule means. You want to think about that user experience as early on as possible in discovery phase and get that research in so you can make something that people are going to understand and appreciate on the back end in the first development process. And then you can just deal with bugs and things like that ongoing. Yeah, and that happens a lot where, when should we get involved as early as possible? Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the elements of experience. Um, so you'll see this is kind of um, set up as layers. So there are various planes that we consider. Uh, looking at the chart here, you can see time. Um, you go from conception to completion, and you also go from abstract to concrete. Um, so the first level um, is the strategy plane. So we're talking about user needs and site objectives. So that's that user research component that we want to deal with initially. You want to understand what those needs are, so you can do market analysis, um, you can do observations and interviews and different studies to kind of get an understanding of that user experience. Um, also looking at the objectives from a, from a business perspective. Then once you have those needs understood and the business objectives, you can get into functional requirements and content requirements, and that's the scope plane. So these are the things that are necessary to build a successful product. Then the structure plane is getting into interaction design. So now you're showing how people interact with the system. Um, how do people navigate the system and things like that, um, getting into information architecture, and then that skeleton plane goes deeper into that information design and navigation. Uh, also interface design, um, so you're diving more deeply into those details. Your wireframes are more high fidelity and things like that. They kind of indicate exactly where buttons should go and things like that, so um, that's the skeleton plane. And then lastly, we have the surface plane, and that's just the visual design component. A lot of times we go from functional requirements straight to visual design and then deal with interface interaction and user needs later, and that's not really the order that makes the most sense um, for creating a successful product. So consider this uh, when you're developing your product. Oh, wait a minute, Again. Tony. I got to sound it, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I was waiting for the sound. Uh, so, uh, so again, we have our uh, mantra. So make a promise to prioritize your development based on deeply knowing your audience. Um, so again, we'll have that market ready product concept available to you on a calculator. We'll actually send that out later, but we'll explain what that is. Um, so you wanna prioritize that development process based on your end user needs and goals. So looking at a user-centered design framework, there are four steps here. So this identify step is um, kind of that user research perspective. Once again, I keep mentioning it, you might get tired of it, but it's really important to do that up front before you actually get into developing and designing the product. Um, so you wanna identify those needs and goals. 
And then uh, you get into the conceptualized stage. Um, so that conceptualized stage is where you begin to sketch and you begin to start to come up with solutions or ideas for solutions to those problems that you've identified, those gaps that you've identified in the market and in the needs of the end users. And this is a very low fidelity stage um, and you wanna iterate there. So then uh, you get into the next stage, which is evaluate. And here you begin to mock up things and start to do usability testing and, and start to really evaluate the quality of the concepts that you've decided on. So you're beginning to narrow your focus at this point. Once you've done a lot of iteration there, then you're ready to develop. And you can get into those sprints and you can begin to confidently develop a product that has requirements that really make sense um, interfacing with the end user needs. So timing is everything when we consider our user research. So as I mentioned, we should get in early. It's very important that you start to do this early. There are a ton of methodologies and you can work with a professional to understand the value of the different methodologies. Um, but getting in early means that you, you have access to more of those methodologies. The less time you have before development and during development, the less you can do. That's not necessarily a bad thing when you get into development as long as you've done the upfront research. Some of the some of the methodologies we have are quick once we're in the development process and we're a sprint ahead. Um, but just want you to keep that in mind that there are more methodologies in that discovery phase to get an understanding of what those end user needs are. So we have a quote by Albert Einstein. Um, if I only had one hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and the remaining five minutes solving it. So again, doing that as early as possible. You know, most development teams definitely um, have a discovery phase and we should de definitely start to add user research to that discovery phase. So 80% um, of your time should be spent in that identify stage and that conceptualize stage where you're identifying the problems and beginning to come up with solutions to those problems way before you begin to put anything down um, in a design uh, system or uh, any kind of coding and development and things like that. Yeah, and the same comes, I mean, we think about, you mentioned magician, you mentioned, you know, DJing. You wouldn't believe how much planning goes into the event beforehand. You know, meeting with the couple, figuring out how things are going to orchestrate. The same when it comes in, you know, to user research is the more time you spend up front that you're just going to benefit later on. That 110, 100 rule really does come into the practice here. So, um, so take factors into UX. You'll notice that there's a little um, indicator here on this chart. You've probably seen this before um, that indicates the value of UX as part of the process. It does factor in. Uh, we mentioned this before. You kind of get a sprint ahead, and uh, you want to really develop that um, intention and, and belief in the quality of a user experience process. So it's not just research. We talk a lot about research, but it's also that user experience design, kind of applying the insights from the research into a successful design from a navigation, kind of that skeleton plane, the navigation um, and interface design. So once again, work ahead, a sprint or a PI ahead. Um, so really that means, I wanna explain that a little bit. Um, so if you're on Sprint 4, you wanna be um, working to um, make user experience designs um, in that Sprint for uh, the next Sprint. Um, so that's kind of the, what we mean here is you wanna be ahead of that actual development process. Um, so there's not so much pressure and there's not so much time to actually make decisions about what you're gonna develop and what uh, how you're gonna uh, create or modify those requirements. Yeah, and it, Lean UX was introduced in Safe 4.5, and there still really is not a standard out there of when best to do this. This is the best practice that we've found working in here. It's just either a sprint ahead or that planning inf increment earlier. That way, then you can take the information and be able to utilize it rather than trying to work in tandem. And it does help once again, to have the team involved, and that's where you know building it together can even be more powerful. Mm -hmm. oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I want to. Uh, 
So back to our mantra. So this is related to our mantra. I want to emphasize that you can do participatory design as well and involve the end users in that design process and solving those problems that they actually have. So you want to prioritize development based on those understandings. So, you know, you want to deeply know your audience. You can actually involve your audience in your research process, obviously, but also in your design process where they're helping you um, sketch out and design solutions. Right. And it's going to take a little more work ahead of time. But if you can involve your users early, it's just going to benefit you later. And we can talk about that, some methods that we use and, and how to orchestrate that. But once again, it just comes down to deeply knowing your audience you know, prior to that development stage, which is all about our mantra today. So let's talk about MRP for a second, because we talked about this a lot, that this market ready product. And I wanted to give you an example of what it means. We talked about this calculator. We're gonna drop the link here in a moment so you can download your own Excel sheet and play around with it and, and understand the value of it. But really what it comes down to is that the UX research is the outcomes are gonna help you prioritize features and it's gonna help engage your team. There's a lot of things that can come out the other side. You know, we, Tony talked about personas, which is that reflection of the end user. We've got journey maps, wireframes, user flows, usability reports. But then this market ready product sheet, this calculator is going to help you get your team all together and work to fuse in the user needs in a visual way rather than in a report or an output. So we'll talk about that as we go through and really wrap our hands around here a moment around this MRP idea. So we talked about understanding the needs of the audience. I talked about, you know, as a DJ, I have to understand who's coming to the event. So I wanna, I'm gonna build a persona. The same comes with when you're understanding the end user of your product. You're maybe send a survey out, maybe go do some observations and understand what the current situation is. Maybe we even go through your analytics to understand who they are. Then if we spin our wheel of UX here, we can land on journey maps. I want to know throughout the evening of an event, you know, I'm going to start out with on a strong note when the dance floor opens, there could be a lull at one moment where maybe everyone is, you know, taking a picture and then I got to bring it back up. The same happens when your user is going through your application. Maybe when they start your application, they're at a really high point, or if they get stuck somewhere, you're going to want to note tape that. That's going to be that journey map. The wireframe, we talked about the visual. I sketch out what the floor plan is before I head to an event. If you're building a wireframe for an application, you're going to build that wireframe and you're going to visualize the setup. The same for user flow. So spin the wheel again, we land on user flows. User flow is how people are going to enter into the room at the event. The same is with your application. How are they entering in? Where are they ending up? What is that flow? That's going to be helpful. So if we spin the wheel again, we'll land on usability reports. So after I leave a venue, I'll write down, okay, I have to load in through this elevator. That plug doesn't work over here. So I'm doing an assessment of the actual venue. The same happens with your application. There's an assessment of where improvements can be. That's going to be that usability report. But this MRP calculator, when I'm DJing the playlist, the song list, that's the most important thing. I'm going in with what the audience wants. I may make some adjustments on the fly. The same with your MIP calculator. This is gonna list the features and it's gonna understand the user needs along with the business goals and the technical constraints. So let's look at a real quick example here. So I want you to say with me, hello, market ready product and goodbye MVP. And what does this mean? Let's take a look at the weighted shorted job first. This is, you've probably seen this, WSJF. This is straight out of Agile. And you'll see here, the user and business value are actually grouped together. And we know from user research that what the user needs and what the business goals are, they could be drastically different because they're being guided by different principles. So that's where this market ready product comes in and splits those in half and says, we're going to measure the user needs here, we're going to measure the business value, and then we're going to look at the technical simplification and traits of that. So that's where this comes in. And I'm going to give you a couple more examples. The example here is around our company is going to launch an idea portal. So let's imagine our imaginary company, we just had an app, now we're going to launch this idea portal where we want to gather ideas from our end users. Well, we're constructing it. What are some of the features? 
Well, this market ready product, we've got the feature on the left, the category. So there's some categories you can choose from the user need. You can actually select a value to technical simplicity. So, you know, how hard is it to create? And then the business value. All these are things that you desire. You know, the user desires this, the developer, this is what you desire. So you're gonna want something that is, you know, easier to create rather than harder generally. And then the business value, you know, where does that lie? And then it's gonna do a calculate down here what the value is. If it highlights in yellow, it's something that you can should consider. Now this MRP calculator, you can use this alongside of everything else that you're using, but you'll see that it's breaking out the user need from the technical and business value. So let's look at an example. So you're gonna have your user need, you're gonna mark that, then you're gonna have your technical simplicity, and then you're gonna have your business value. And business value, you may have something you know one through five, and then you're gonna get your total at the end here. So let's look at an example. So we, in our MRP, we've got you know English to Spanish. Someone said, hey, it would be great if we had this translation feature in there, okay, great. So I'm gonna put it in the category of deployment and the user need one through five. I heard after doing interviews and surveys that from the users, it's a very high need. So I'm gonna mark that at four. Now, technical simplicity, there is in our development team, we're, are gonna, we're gonna have to do some research. So it's gonna be a little harder. So I'm gonna mark it a two because five would be something that, oh yeah, that's sure. I. I that's, we want that as a development group. That's something we can easily create. So two would be harder. So I'm gonna market a two. And then from the business value, the business sees it as high. So I'm gonna give that a four. So if you add that up, it becomes a 10. It doesn't trip off in the value until it gets over a seven. And you can change that value, but this is just gonna give you a quick indicator. Is this something our team should pay attention to with the users in mind? So let's look at another one real quick, onboarding. We got an idea that said, hey, we should have onboarding. When people land on the idea portal, should we message them and say, hey, welcome. So we'll put that in product planning and the user need, yeah, it's high because it's gonna help them integrate. The technical simplicity, it's a little easier. Or we can use something we already have, we already built for our website. So we should be able to integrate that into the idea portal. And then business value is high. So we add those together, it's a 13. Great. Well, let me give you an example of one where spell check. So this is a little bit different. So let's add a spell check into our deal portal. So the user need is low because you know typically I'm just entering in and it's not something that it's gonna stop me from entering my idea. So I'm gonna enter it as low. Technical, it's somewhere in the middle. You know, I'm probably gonna have to put some kind of technology into this, but we may be able to use something that we have in our design system. And then from the business value, it's low because most of the moderators on the site already are correcting everything before it gets published out there. So even if there's a misspell, it goes into a queue before it gets published. So we have our moderators looking at it. So they're like, yeah, we don't really need that. So you can see it comes back as a six. So it's not as important to really focus on. So this gives you a view into the user's needs and then calculating in technical sim simplicity and business value. And it allows you to prioritize the findings and help which ones add value, you know, how to guide decisions and move through. So we're gonna give you the opportunity to play around with the MRP calculator. I'm gonna drop that link here in the chat in a moment. We'll also can follow up afterwards after the conference and get you to that. But that's how one of the outputs is it's going to get you together. You know, your team is going to be able to see the value and be able to collaborate on that document together. You're going to have all the stakeholders together to do that. So Tony, I know we went through a lot of information here, but let's start off with the value of user research again. Yep. So again, it minimizes rework. Uh, we talked about that 110, 100 rule. Um, and you, you have to do less development on the back end if you get it right initially. So uh, in order to get it right initially, you should do user research and do UX design throughout. So then improving processing time, uh, customer wait time. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to necessarily, um, as a, from a customer perspective, deal with um, some of that processing, uh, some of those processing um, time issues. And then competitiveness. So thinking about productivity, um, you know, your, um, your product is more competitive in the market um, and, and you can kind of, from a development perspective, um, really compete with, with 
some of the um, folks that um, have similar solutions. And then raise team spirit. Again, we talked about personas and building empathy for the actual end user, um, including the end user in the design process. Um, that actually raises team spirit. And then reducing risk. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that risk um, can be introduced into a, a product, as you know. Um, once, if you do that user research initially and do UX design throughout um, and research throughout, you can reduce that risk. Right. And we talked a lot about Agile, Tony. I mean, you went in depth on you know, making sure you're including this in your development cycle. I think one of the biggest takeaways that we stressed was B, which is just making sure you're creating a lane for the work or sprint in your PI. As long as you're working ahead, we found that that's the, the best value because then you can get everyone involved. You can plan for it. You can make sure you can take advantage of the information and then you'll be able to utilize that throughout. Is there any other big points here, Tony, that you see on making time for Agile that you wanted to stress? Yeah, I want to um, I want to emphasize um, going back to MRP. Um, so you talked a lot about that as well, changing that terminology and using that calculator. You may be wondering, how do I prioritize? The, the end user experience and the user needs. Uh, we have some additional ideas around that and concepts like task maps that we can share with you to kind of help you prioritize some of those goals and needs. Um, you already know how to do that for um, some of the other components like business value and the technical constraints, but we can also introduce some things to help you prioritize those needs. Yeah, that's a good point. And then last but not least, we, we talked about you know, I just went through a whole thing about, uh, you know, how you can use those outcomes in Agile. Any, any of the ones here that, Tony, that you think are some of the most important that our audience should walk away thinking about? Yeah, I think engaging the team as well as the end users to be part of the research. Um, so when we say team, we mean like developers and QA folks and folks like that, um, kind of being involved in that research process so they can build that empathy and really care about that end user experience. Mm -hmm. Now, wait a minute. So last time we want to share with you the mantra, make a promise to prioritize your development based on deeply knowing your audience. So you as by now know what this means, um, getting in early and making sure you're using um, UX practices throughout your development process to really emphasize that um, audience perspective. I hope you internalize that. <laughs> and we want you to you know, think like a DJ, you know, build that MRP, you know, that product that people are just ready to use rather than the minimum. And it's going to lead to collaboration and it's going to lead to happy customers. So we wanted to thank you. We did drop into the chat room, the link to download the MRP calculator. So take advantage of that, play around with that, reach out to us. If you have questions on how to use it, it's definitely a tool that you can rally around and use it in complementary to other tools that you use as well, but it's really going to help elevate and highlight the user research. So we're going to turn it over. If there's any questions, we wanted to you know, reserve time. If there's anything that jumped out, I know we threw a lot of information out at you. Oh, Thank see. you so much. There is one in there. I don't know if Wait. you guys want to read it pretty long. Go ahead. <laughs> or you want me to read it? <laughs> Let's see. Would it be possible for a development team to communicate with the marketing team of a company for help with user research or are the two disciplines too different for this kind of cross communication to occur? Okay, so break that apart. So it's, would it be possible for a development team to communicate with the marketing team to help with the user research? So I actually was on the marketing team at one point in my life. And yes, I think there's a certain aspect of that aspect you can use. One of the ones was, because there's plenty of ways to gather research. And I think marketing teams have a lot of knowledge, especially when it comes to the analytics side and kind of pulse of the audience. So I think you could do some techniques where you could work with the marketing team to partner with that. But I think you would have to come in specifically with what your goals are. You know, what are you trying to learn is the top thing that I generally ask people. So if you can go to them, what are you trying to learn? Answer that question before you meet with them. I think that will help drive that. Tony, did you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I think the marketing team can also help with um, marketing market fit. Um, so thinking about the idea you have, they can investigate um, 
sort of the general market and industry as a whole um, and kind of inform that um, initial process as well. So we can do research based on some of those ideas and hypotheses. Um, so we can definitely communicate with the marketing team. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think it's a great question. Um, they're not too different as far as that cross communication to occur. Yeah, and I think another thing, I, as you were speaking, Tony, is the marketing team can definitely also help you identify participants that could be part of the research as well. Because finding participants, we talked about, you know, participatory design and getting those involved in your design earlier. You really need to make sure you're finding the right particip participants to be involved. So I think the marketing team has a pulse on that, and you can possibly put a you know, a link or a poll somewhere on the website or wherever, whatever tool you are, you know, showcasing to gather those users. And that's typically where that marketing team really could help leverage the access to users. Awesome. So there is a two more that popped in there. Um, Bill was asking, is there anything about developing products for corporate employees that changes the process laid out or can they be treated pretty much the same? Yeah. So Tony, do you want to take that one and I can jump in? Sure. Um, yeah, it's pretty much the same. You know, um, they're end users um, of a particular product or service. Um, so you really do the same thing. Um, do that initial sort of discovery process. Um, understand what their needs are. You don't really need to, um, if you're working internally, um, understand the market so much, um, you know, when you're developing solutions, uh, but you definitely need to understand those needs and goals and how to make that pro how to make those um, things more efficient. I know with, with employees, they're kind of forced to use systems, um, but we still want to make those systems as user friendly as possible so they can be as productive as possible as well. Yeah, and I would say one thing to add to that is when you do internal, there typically are you know different like legal requirements you may need to follow depending on if you know, you're going to interact with you know a certain uh, you know group. But generally, you also want to think about you're always going to hear this internally. Oh well, you may not want to talk to this group of users, <laughs> but when you do that, make sure that you get a good mix of people that have been you know tenured. You know, maybe they've been there a while and they have a lot of insight. And then the people that were just hired as well, that way you kind of get a nice cross, you know, understanding of the perception. And we typically say, you know, if someone is you know, giving you feedback, well, how would a colleague feel about that? That way people have a hard time describing how they feel. So if you deflect it to someone else, that will help internally as well. And, and make sure that you make feel they're, they're comfortable the entire time. Good question. Awesome. And there's one more I see in here from John. What type of incentives do you offer your customers for their feedback, or would you recommend a dedicated paid panel? Yeah, that's a good one. Well, I'll, I'll take the first part and I'll flip it over to Tony. But since we're talking about internal, in, generally internally, you really can't, you know, based upon you know, how your organization is, you really can't give incentives to people internally, but you can thank them for improving the product, which believe it or not, goes a really long way that people are helping improve your product that because they're using it every day. So if that question on internal, that really is a great way to position it. Hey, we want to make this better for you. And then that will give you, you know, the driver's seat. What about the other side, Tony? Yeah, and external uh, pay panels work great. You know, there are a lot of user research systems that have a recruiting component. Um, you can also hire a recruiter. Um, you know, if you have a bunch of participants, like with a survey, you can do <clears throat> you can do things like um, kind of saying five people will be randomly selected to get a hundred dollars or something like that. Um, if you have a ton of people involved, but you want to keep the survey short and everything, it's not you know you don't want to have it be too long if they might not get an incentive. Uh, but yeah, you know, definitely try to incentivize and like Mark said, even with the external, let them know that they're really and remind them that they're really going to improve this product based on their feedback even during the session right after the study, say that and say, you know, we really appreciate everything you said is very insightful and we'll apply it to our design going forward. Yeah, and then, you know, keep track of the people that you spoke with because in your, your follow-up survey, you can ask them, would you be interested in follow-up research? 
And if they are, depending on how often you're going to be upgrading, you could reach out to them after a certain period. Typically, we'll, we'll leave a period of time because we don't want to bring the same users in over and over. But letting someone know that their feedback mattered goes a long way too because they will stay with you for your, with your company saying, wow, they actually listened to me. So whether that's a, you know, a release note or something that happens, letting them know that you heard them, wow, that, that just really goes a long way. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to one of the PTC members and we can help you out, or you can reach out to the presenters, um, if, um, get their contact information. They can answer anything that you have. So thank you guys so much for your presentation. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Have a great day. That um, concludes today as day one of the Pittsburgh Tech Fest. We hope everyone can join us again tomorrow morning. Our sessions start at nine o'clock tomorrow. Um, the first three sessions in the morning are making finding where you belong easy for everyone, what the heck mass script, and the science of testing. So we hope that you can join us for day two. Enjoy day one and um, hope to see you all soon. Thank you.